Hey guys, welcome to Man Medicine, where we talk about how men can optimize their health and avoid the collapsing U.S. healthcare system. I'm going to talk today a little bit about what I consider to be, and what many scientists consider to be, one of the root causes of all of the chronic diseases that we're seeing, all of the chronic diseases that I end up taking care of in the emergency room, things like type 2 diabetes, coronary artery disease, heart failure, chronic kidney disease, cancer, dementia, all of these in some cases, not all, but in some cases have a single root cause. And that root cause is something called lipotoxicity. And if you haven't heard of that term before, it, you can probably figure out what it means based on the word lipotoxicity. So fat toxicity or fat poisoning. And, you know, essentially this is a situation where you have accumulated enough body fat that you are essentially causing widespread toxicity throughout your body that manifests in a number of different ways. And that's why lipotoxicity can cause all of these different um, underlying conditions. You know, Alzheimer's is obviously very different than coronary artery disease, but they may have their root cause in certain individuals uh, with the same thing, which is lipotoxicity. So lipotoxicity is something that really is only I won't say recently, but within the last 10 or 15 years has been recognized as a, as a phenomenon. I know that uh, when I was in medical school, <laughs> we, had, we had no lectures on this. We learned basically that body fat is where you store extra calories and basically it protects your organs and keeps you warm in the wintertime. And that was the purpose of body fat. Well, now the medical establishment, the scientific community knows a whole lot more about the human body in general. And we know that fat is actually an endocrine tissue, uh, which kind of blew my mind when I learned about that. So what that means is that fat secretes hormones, these things called adipokines and adipocytokines. And the last time I checked, there's well over a hundred of these that have been identified. And almost every single one of them, when present in excess, causes some sort of harm to your system in one way or the other. Uh, so this is why chronic obesity is is killing the medical system and this is why i tell you guys that i think the, the healthcare system in this country is going to collapse and the root cause in my opinion is largely due to the obesity epidemic so in lipotoxicity essentially after very prolonged periods of obesity prolonged periods of excess calorie intake your fat cells ability to normally store fat in a healthy way essentially becomes overwhelmed and so you have all this, all these free fatty acids in your blood. You are no longer able to store fat in fat cells in the places where it's supposed to be. And you get spillover of fat into other tissues where it never, it never belonged in the first place. And that's where these different disease states start coming into play. So you get fat deposition in the liver. You get fatty liver disease. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. You can get fat uh, that deposits itself in the heart. It can lead to problems there. Uh, in the skeletal muscle tissue, we'll talk about that too, uh, all throughout the body in places that it's not intended to be. And that essentially is what, uh, in a nutshell, is what lipotoxicity is all about. So I want to show you guys a little diagram here that, that shows kind of how this works. And here we have um, you know, a blob of muscle tissue, and we can see how it, it affects both the muscle, the liver, and then in the middle here we have the, the pancreas. And without then going into all the painful details here, you can see that um, there is essentially an inflammatory response from all of this excess bo visceral body fat in places that it shouldn't be. So you have all these extra free fatty acids, all these interleukins, all these adipocytokines, which are causing chronic inflammation. Um, in terms of the liver, when fat gets deposited in the liver, you, you essentially you develop what's called fatty liver disease, which can progress to steatosis, which in some cases progresses all the way to cirrhosis. And we'll talk a little bit about that. That leads to a whole cascade of other effects, um, including insulin resistance. In addition to the effects on the muscle, that also leads to insulin resistance. Uh, a more atherogenic lipid profile. So you get accelerated heart disease, peripheral vascular disease, things that I've talked about in other um, in other podcasts. It's a, it's a bad situation. The pancreas is trying to keep up with this insulin resistance. It, it secretes more insulin. Um, you get hyperinsulinemia, which also can drive atherosclerotic disease. And eventually the beta cells many times will fail. They'll give out. 
and um, you'll become dependent on insulin. I see that all the time in the emergency room. Uh, people who have been type 2 diabetics for many, many, many years and finally have just burned out their pancreas um, and uh, are now dependent on insulin because they can't produce enough. And then in the muscle tissue, this fat infiltrates the muscle tissue, it infiltrates in between the muscle tissue, it causes direct toxicity to the muscle itself and can ultimately lead to muscle cell death, something called uh, sarcopenia and um, is, is a major, major problem. So let's talk about fatty liver disease briefly. This is another uh, diagram that I wanna show you and this is the prevalence of fatty liver disease around the world. And this is very shocking. Um, in the United States, it's over 30% of the US population, and I suspect it's much higher, actually has fatty liver disease. And you can see it's, it's prevalent throughout most of the developed world, all through the Middle East. And um, looks like only place where it's not prevalent is Russia. <laughs> but I don't believe that. I bet it's prevalent there too. So this is directly related to obesity. Um, there's the, it, obesity is the causal factor um, in almost all of these cases. There are obviously genetic components to this, uh, so it's not it's not quite that simple. But this is a huge problem. Okay, thirty percent plus of the population with fatty liver disease has major ramifications because it's thirty percent now, but. You know, as we all know, the obesity epidemic isn't going anywhere, right? It's it's only progressing. So that number is going to go up and up and up. So, so what's the big deal about having fatty liver disease? I, I see it every single day in the emergency department. I would estimate it's probably in my population, close to 50% of the people I see have fatty liver disease. And then that, that may not be the reason that they're there to see me. Uh, I may get routine blood work on them for some other reason. I'll notice that their liver enzymes are elevated and then I'll go look through their chart and I see that somebody, you know, some other physician at some point in the, in the past has gotten either a CT of their liver or a, a liver ultrasound that shows fatty liver disease. So extremely common in the population that I see. I, I, I think it's over 30% uh, in, in my particular population, but nationwide it's estimated to be around you know, maybe roughly a third uh, of people. So this has major implications because fatty liver disease in about 5% of people, maybe a little bit more, progresses to something called steatohepatitis. Okay, this is where now all of this fat tissue has become, it, you've crossed the threshold of inflammation where you are directly damaging your liver. You're, you're killing off liver cells. And about, um, 25%, maybe maybe a little bit more of people with steatohepatitis, they progress on to full liver cirrhosis and failure. So traditionally, the number one cause of people ending up on a liver transplant list in the United States has been for hepatitis C. And that's still the case overall, but in women, this is the number one cause of being on a liver transplant list. Liver failure in the United States, number one cause is obesity-related cirrhosis from steatohepatitis, which is mind-boggling to me, all right? Now, by 2030, it's estimated that, um, especially because we've got, we've actually got pretty good treatments for hepatitis C right now, so we're gonna see the number of people on transplant lists from hep C is obviously gonna go down as more people get access to treatment, hopefully. Um, but the obesity epidemic is gonna essentially, I've seen numbers as high as uh, we're going to see like a 50 to 60% rise in the number of people who are on the liver transplant list. And that's directly going to be a result of the sequela of fatty liver. So, you know, I, I I'll tell you firsthand, there, there's not a lot of, there, there's not enough livers to go around as it is. So you can imagine what do you think is going to happen to these people guys that, that end up on a liver transplant list um, as a result of the sequelae of fatty liver. Um, you know, unless there's some major breakthrough for this condition, which there, by the way, there, there is no good treatment for it, medical treatment. The treatment is weight loss, fat loss specifically. Um, the, they're going to die. The, I, I don't know how else um, this is going to end up. And uh, it, as somebody that takes care of people with liver failure um, on a regular basis, and any of you that have had family members that have died of chronic liver disease, it's uh, it's a it's a horrible way to go, um, and uh, you know I wouldn't wish that on anybody. So th this is going to be it, it is a major problem now. It's going to be a colossal problem in the next ten to twenty years for this country, and you know all over the world. And the scary thing is is that this is now becoming really prevalent in kids. So 
10% of kids in the United States have fatty liver disease. And um, this is a chart here showing the distribution by age. You can see it really picks up in the later teenage years. But look at this age 11. I mean, it looks like just under 10% of the kids with fatty liver disease are, are age 11. Um, again, I, I want you to think forward in time. We know, we know where this ends up. What, what do you think these kids, what do you think their life is going to be like in 20 years? Many of these kids will need a liver transplant, barring some medical breakthrough. Um, so, you know, if, if you have a child, for example, that, you know, routine, gets, uh, has fatty liver disease, say, picked up routinely on their pediatric um, physical or well-child visit, um, this is a four-alarm fire, in my opinion. As a parent, you need to be all over this and... You need to do whatever whatever you need to do to get your child to lose body fat. You need to get them exercising and they need to clean up their diet um, because this this is going to shorten their life uh, in a major way. It has a potential to, um, at least. So enough ranting on fatty liver disease. It's a huge deal. Um, I, I'm glad to see that the medical community is starting to recognize it as a bigger problem, but um, you know, th this has been here for a long time. I've been seeing this in the emergency room for decades, but I will tell you that the, the number of patients that I'm seeing with it is just going up and up and up. And it's, uh, it's kind of scary. So, um, you know, I'm not going to go into every single organ system here uh, that's affected by lipotoxicity, um, but liver and muscle tissue are the ones that I think are, are the most important and worth, worth uh, um, covering today. So as you guys know, I am, I'm very big on muscle tissue. In my opinion, muscle tissue is probably the most health promoting tissue in your body. It's um, arguably not possible to have too much health, too much muscle tissue. Um, I'm assuming that you've built it, you know, not with anabolic steroids, etc. But um, skeletal muscle you only benefit by gaining skeletal muscle. I don't know that you can say that about any other organ tissue. Skeletal muscle is one of the major contributors to insulin sensitivity and uh, preventing type 2 diabetes. Um, it holds a lot of glucose in the form of glycogen. So, for example, like after you have a meal, 80% of your postprandial glucose that's in your blood, um, that ends up in your muscle tissue. Some goes to your liver and then, you know, in, into other places as well. But, um, 80% goes into your muscle. So if you have a lot of muscle tissue, you're just, you're pulling that glucose out of your system. You're, you're very sensitive to insulin. So you're, you're not putting stress on your pancreas. Muscle tissue is, is extremely important. And when you start getting lipotoxicity and you get deposition of these abnormal inflammatory fat deposits in your muscles, it is severely toxic to the muscle tissue itself. There's something called uh, fatty acylcoenzyme A. It's it's not worth going into what that is, but it's an enzyme that builds up in the muscle tissue. It's directly related to um, insulin resistance. So the more of this stuff that you get as a result of all this fat, the more insulin resistant you get, the little insulin receptors in the uh, membrane of the muscle start to get withdrawn. And um, it's, there's a direct correlation between that and insulin resistance and type two diabetes. But the other more important thing that it may do is it actually is directly toxic to the mitochondria, which are the little energy powerhouses in your cells. And mitochondrial dysfunction is implicated in tons of different disease states, uh, including uh, premature aging. And so this uh, fatty acyl coenzyme A, FA coenzyme A, they call it, um, it actually interferes with the electron transport chain. And so ATP levels, which is the fuel that drives every almost every metabolic process in your body, ATP levels start to drop, and in many cases, the mitochondria will die, That also, and then that leads to cell death. And so, um, just like with neurons in your brain, cardiac muscle cells as well, skeletal muscle cells, when they die, you don't replace them. They, you, you get a certain amount, and if they die off, you're, you're not growing any new ones. So you really need to, you need to hold on to the muscle tissue that you have, the number of cells that you have for as long as you possibly can. And um, uh, lipotoxicity is a major contributor to sarcopenia. Um, sarcopenia is, is abnormal muscle wasting. And I used to see sarcopenia mainly um, in like 
cancer patients who are really cachectic, they weren't eating. Uh, burn patients that have a you know hypermetabolic state will burn off all their muscle tissue. Um, certain patients with chronic lung disease like COPD, we used to call them the pink puffers, we usually were very emaciated um, as well. They had sarcopenia, but now I'm seeing more and more obesity related sarcopenia. And I wanna show you guys a, a CAT scan here. This is a, um, it's not a, one of my patients, but this is a CAT scan of a uh, female patient in 50s to 60s, I think. Um, and when you're looking at a CAT scan, this is like looking at a human being, uh, sort of like you've, you're cutting through like a honey baked ham and you're looking up uh, from their feet, okay? So you can see, I mean, it's pretty obvious, all of this fat tissue here, all of this dark gray material, you can kind of see the fat rolls you know, coming around the side here. But what I wanna draw your attention to it's not so much how much fat there is that this person is carrying, but look how wimpy and wispy these muscles are, um, especially the abdominal wall muscles. You, you know, the, you would think that somebody who's carrying around a lot of excess body weight, their muscles would hypertrophy and compensate to carry around that weight. But that's not actually not what you see in many people who are obese. And it's directly related to this sarcopenic uh, lipotoxicity. Uh, the, these people, not only are they mostly sedentary, but they have, um, they have really thin, wispy muscles. And it's directly due to unhealthy muscle tissue from all this excess fat. Um, so this, this CAT scan is something... Uh, this is almost the norm with where I work. Um, I see middle-aged and elderly people coming in all the time with CAT scans that look just like this. There's a little tiny person and then there's this huge amount of body fat around them. And then as you scroll through and you look at the muscle tissue, you look at their glutes, their psoas muscle, um, you look and look at their chest and shulder musculature, it's a, if it's a chest CT, it's these thin, wispy, weak muscles. and. Um, you know, that's a direct result of lipotoxicity, um, among other things. So that's all I wanted to talk with you guys about today. Um, I wanted to just make you aware of that this phenomenon exists. It, this is all the more reason why you just cannot let yourself get obese, guys. And if you are obese, you need to fix it and you need to fix it ASAP. If you want to lead a long, healthy life and you want to stay out of the, the medical system, which trust me, is is on the verge of collapse and it, it, it will collapse. And so you want to stay out of it. Um, you need to, if you're over, even if you're just a little bit overweight, you need to fix that. And then the second thing you need to do is you need to put on as much healthy skeletal muscle as your genetics will allow, uh, because that is going to pay dividends for you down the road uh, in ways that uh, you may not even recognize at this point. Uh, we all, you know, we all know it looks good. Yeah, great. You'll look good naked. But metabolically, you're going to be so much healthier. You're going to live a longer, more active, more healthy life. And uh, obviously, that's, uh, you know, that's what we all want, right? So that's all I have for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed this, and uh, I will catch you next time. All Man Medicine video and audio has been created and shared online for informational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute the practice of medicine or professional healthcare services of any kind, including the giving of medical advice. I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship has been established. This content is not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied upon solely for that purpose either. The only purpose of this content is to present peer-reviewed, research-backed health information for your consideration. As always, rely on the advice and guidance of your personal physician before undertaking any activity presented here, and if in doubt or not comfortable with said activity, practice discretion. Your health is your responsibility and not ours. Finally, I take conflicts of interest seriously. I accept no compensation whatsoever from any private corporations, including pharmaceutical or supplement companies. You can trust that if I recommend a medication, product, or service, it's because I genuinely believe in it and not because I'm being paid to endorse it.